So, I have two older brothers, and for privacy reasons, we'll call them O and D. O was in high school at the time, and D was at his girlfriend's house after skipping. I really had a raging fever, so I was staying home. My mom was at her job, and my father was at a doctor's appointment. Now that that's all cleared up, I was sitting in my bed with an ice pack over my eyes, with some music playing from the small Bluetooth speaker next to my bed. I was really lucky today, because instead of doing an algebra test, I would be sitting in my bed cold with a coffee. I had been watching some YouTube videos on my phone for about an hour, as I could recall, when I then heard a knock on my front door. Now, I don't really have any friends, and well, my neighbors had no reason to knock on the door. I took off my ice pack, set it on my nightstand, and then walked to the front door. Being the stupid kid that I was, I looked out the window and into the peephole. For some context, when you walk into my house, there was two large windows on either side of the door, and then directly across, there was a staircase, and a few feet to both sides of the entrance, there were hallways leading to different rooms. Well, when I looked out the window, there was a man who I could tell was in his 50s, the guy was just standing there, and he was trying to spy in the peephole. His grin went from ear to ear when he saw me standing at the window. My eyes began to widen as my heart sank. I ran up the stairs to my mother's room, and I sat in her closet. The worst thing was when I heard the glass shatter. I hear footsteps come up the creaky old stairs as I dialed 911 on my phone. I don't know how I got this lucky, but instead of coming into my mom's room, but instead, he walked into my older brother's room, searched his closet and under his bed, then went out. Then he walked into Dee's bedroom, doing the same thing to his. Then just as he was about to check my young sister's room, I then heard my saviors. Sirens and flashing blue and red lights filled my heart as I then heard screaming. Some of them yelling, Open up, it's the police! And then barged down the front door. I then ran out of the closet and right into the arms of an officer, not taking in just how many officers were actually there. The police called my parents, and my mom came home right away. When I got questioned by the police, all I can make out is that he was 5'7 and was in his 50s. The man was arrested, but I don't really know what happened after that. This happened 8 years ago, but it still really terrifies me to this day. This happened shortly after the pandemic started, and unfortunately, I just figured out that the buses were running a reduced schedule, meaning they had stopped running at 9 instead of the usual midnight, so I stood there at the bus stop trying to come up with a plan. My husband and I don't really have much money, so a cab was out of the question, and I had our only phone, so calling him wasn't an option. Considering that the pandemic was picking up, not to mention it was 11 p.m., I obviously didn't feel comfortable bothering any friends, so my options were limited. I was also cursing myself for not looking at the bus schedule sooner. I resigned to the fact that I was going to be walking the two hours home, all alone in the dark, with no weapon. About half an hour of the walk was city streets and sidewalks. After that, I had a choice to make. I could continue down this street, or I could walk down the bike path, which would shave half an hour of my walk and come within a hundred feet of my house. I literally stood at the corner trying to decide which path to take for like two or three minutes. The well-lit street, or the much shorter but completely dark bike path. In the end, I decided to take the bike path, reasoning to myself that I was less likely to encounter anyone on the path than the busy streets. So many bad decisions that night. After making my decision, I decided to at least pick up a solid rock just in case of an emergency. So armed with my makeshift weapon, I started into the dark woods. I probably should have started the story with this information, but anyway, I'm a 30 year old female, I'm 6 feet tall, and 150 pounds, so I'm not fat but I'm definitely larger than most men, which I've always really hated. I got clean 4 years ago, but prior to that I was actually a heroin addict for 10 years. It was its own decade of hellish incidents, like being assaulted, being held at gunpoint, being homeless, 
constantly in and out of prison. And worst of all, I've watched two people overdose and die. I could honestly write about dozens of terrible things that happened back then. But I was an IV drug addict living a very dangerous life. So it really sucked, but it wasn't a surprise when terrible things happened. I lived prepared to die at any moment, and I was fine with that. That's why this incident affected me so terribly. I mean, after I'd gotten clean and left my old dangerous life behind, I honestly felt like no harm could befall me. Like nothing bad could happen to me unless I brought it upon myself. I desperately wanted to live now, and I thought that desire was enough. But I was very quickly reminded this isn't true. My old life left me very cynical, but also very aware and street smart. So when I then heard the sound of someone else walking down the bike path towards me, their feet crunching on the crushed rock, I was instantly on edge. At that point, I didn't feel like I was in danger, just that I had to keep on my toes until this person was no longer near me, especially because of my reduced vision. To explain a little better, I live in the north of Canada, in one of the most northern cities actually, and this all took place in June. So here during the summer months, it's almost never completely dark. It just looks like dusk or dawn is about to come, but it's like that all night. So although I could make out this guy's shadow, or what I assumed was a man coming towards me, I really couldn't see any details at all. But the closer he came towards me, the more confused and terrified I became. I thought he was walking like a scarecrow. His hands out stretched to the air, which was disturbing enough. Then I realized he was carrying a large stick across his back with his arms resting along it. Now initially, I was really relieved to see this, that he wasn't acting like a crazy scarecrow. He was just prepared to defend himself on this dark path as I was. Definitely nothing wrong with that. I had a large rock in my hand, and I wasn't planning violence, but my relief was short-lived. About 40 feet away, the man then said, Who's there? And looking back, this was my final screw-up. I now believe he was just trying to find out if I was a man or woman. But being really stupid and an over-friendly Canadian, I said back, Hey man, I'm just heading home. Hey man, I'm just heading home. But as soon as I answered, he started picking up his speed and moving forward without another word. So I yelled, Hey man, either back the fuck up or put the big stick down. But he didn't either. Instead, he then took the stick and then started taking practice swings in the air, like he had a baseball bat and was stepping up to the plate. That was when I knew something terrible was about to go down, and my rock was useless. I then started screaming at him, asking him, What are you doing? What do you want? Do you want my money? Just take my phone and wallet. His response was just terrible. He said, No girl, you can keep that stuff. I'm not taking evidence from my victims. <laughs> Girl, that's not getting caught 101. That sentence kicked in a fight or flight response, which was flight. I tried running around him, but he had come towards me so fast, he easily wound up and hit me right in the back of the head. But either he didn't connect properly, or my adrenaline didn't let me feel it. It knocked me off balance and I stumbled, almost falling to the ground. Fleeing this man wasn't an option anymore. Fight kicked in, and I became so incredibly angry. How dare he? How dare he make me scared? Does he have any idea what I've been through? So I then turned around, trying to anticipate his next move. He seemed like he recognized me, or there was some hesitation. For the briefest of seconds, I thought maybe he was having a moment of humanity or something, but that wasn't it. In a flash, any hesitation was gone and he was winding up to hit me again. I squared up and ran right towards him, knowing if I got close, he wouldn't be able to swing at me. But he was faster, hitting me in the side and knocking the wind out of me. As I struggled to catch my breath, the man backed up so he could swing again, this time knocking me to the ground. I'm really not sure how many times he hit me while I was on the ground. It was this crazy passage of time. It was so fast, but also slow in time. I can't really explain it. But then he was standing over me, stick raised over his head, and then he said to me, You better take it off, girl, 
or I'm going to beat you till you're dead or passed out. I'd rather you take it off for me, but this is happening one way or another. Then, I had this really weird calm pass over me. Everything became clearer in my head, and it was almost like my husband was whispering right into my ear. A good kick to the knee will drop the toughest man. My husband lived a rough life too, and this was always a joke he made. Not happy? Kick him in the knee. It'll drop anyone. He often joked that it was the only thing he learned in street fighting, and it would only be used as a last resort. So I looked up at the man, and then said, Okay, okay, I'll do it. Just please stop hitting me. I didn't even need to see the details on his face. I could hear him smiling when he then said, That's a good girl. And then took a step closer. I unbuttoned my jeans, and he took another step. That was close enough. I drew back my leg, kicked him in the side of the knee, and it worked. He screamed and fell to his knees, almost falling right on top of me. But now he wanted on top of me for different reasons. I could just tell he was in kill mode. He was screaming, I'll fucking kill you, bitch. Over and over as we wrestled on the ground, me trying to stand up, him trying to wrap his hands around my throat. I've never been so happy in my life to see red and blue lights or to hear police sirens. But my God, I was so happy when I could hear a siren. I figured it was probably just driving on the adjacent road. Perhaps the best coincidence ever. But when I saw the red and blue lights reflecting off the trees in front of me, I knew then that it was finally over. I've never felt such relief. I sank to the ground crying. This asshole lying beside me, panting and swearing at me, but not trying to kill me anymore. If there's any light or funny memory of the night, this is it. A random man on rollerblades then half ran, half rolled further down the path. It was honestly hilarious in a moment like this. He couldn't decide to run or rollerblade towards us because of the crushed rock. So it was this crazy awkward moment of half running, half rolling, and waving his arms around yelling for the police. Over here! Come over here! By then I was so relieved and my emotions were so screwed up, I was laughing and crying at the same time like a crazy person, as two cops jumped out of their car and then ran up. After that, it was honestly just a blur. They called me an ambulance, kindly picked up my husband, and met me back at the hospital. As it turns out, the man on the rollerblades had apparently been screwed by the bus just like me, and he was rollerblading home on the adjacent road when he heard me being attacked and then called the police, saying he could hear a woman being attacked on the path. This attack changed me. It changed everything. And not for the good either. It really brought back repressed memories of other assaults. And without my coping strategy of drugs, it was so much harder than it was before. Nothing to numb that pain and years of trauma brought back to the surface. There's a few positive things, I suppose. I spoke with the cops after they helped me to figure out why he hesitated to attack me. He told them, I didn't realize how big she was, or I never would have gone after her. He also admitted to assaulting two other women. None of these charges have been brought to court yet, but I'm going to be ready to testify when they are. Since I apparently tore the muscles and ligaments in his knee, guy who tried to assault me and derail my life, I can't fucking wait to see you again, and I really hope you're still limping when I do. This happened back when I was 15, and my little sister was 10. For some context, my parents had got divorced when I was 7, and my sister was 2. My mom got custody of us, and I've only seen my dad about 3 times a year. Anyways, this happened in late November, early December in 2017. I also live in Colorado, so there was already about 6 inches of snow on the ground when this happened. My mom had to work the late shift this night, so I was responsible for my sister. I put her to bed at about 10, watched some TV, and had been texting my friends. It was right around 12.30 when I had started to get really tired. I was watching infomercials for dumb products when my sister came in the living room. What are you doing up? You know you need to be in bed. I said. I heard some noises outside the window. She shakily said. I went into her room and I then saw boot prints in the snow. I just told her to go back to sleep. 
I decided to go to bed then because I was really tired. I was sleeping really peacefully until I heard my sister screaming. And it wasn't just any scream either. It was one of the most blood-curdling screams I think I've ever heard. I ran in the room with the baseball bat and I saw this tall, lanky man standing over my sister. I ran to the man with the bat and then swung as hard as I could. It was enough to make the man jump back out the window and then run away. I let my sister stay in my room with me for the rest of the night. We didn't call the cops because, well, at this point he was long gone and we didn't think there was much we could do. I'm now 19 years old and my sister's 14 and we bring that night up very often. I'm just really, really glad and thankful that my sister wasn't kidnapped or hell, even worse. I still get the goosebumps even thinking about it. So about four years ago, my parents were going out. With that, I was going to be home alone for at least three to six hours. They left around six and they said they'd be home around nine to twelve. When they left, I went downstairs, got snacks, and put on some Netflix to look around for a new show. After like two hours watching a new show, that's when I then heard a strange noise coming from the front porch. Keep in mind, I have a wraparound porch and there's a lot of windows looking out. Me being curious, I pulled back the curtains and then looked out into the very dark yard. After looking around, nothing really seemed off to me. That is, until I then saw a black silhouette of a man standing by the front door. I froze in fear, dropping the curtains and ran all the way upstairs into my parents' room. After five minutes of waiting, I decided to text my parents. I told them the incident and they didn't even believe me, given that I was only 13 and I guess they thought I was making it up or something. I actually sat there, thinking maybe it was my imagination. I decided to walk back downstairs and just try and finish my show. I realized the motion light sensor in the backyard was now on. Now you can either turn the light on yourself, or if anything walks by it, it'll automatically turn on. Keep in mind that this light isn't very sensitive. Most times it only turns on if a person or animal walks by it. Once I realized what was going on, I immediately ran back into my parents' room, and once again I was in tears. I picked up the house phone to call the police when I then heard a whisper from outside my window. Hey there, I know you're inside. Why don't you just come outside real quick? I just want to have some fun with you. My heart then dropped and was about to beat out of my chest. I froze in fear then snapped back out of it and called 911. The 911 operator told me to hide in a closet and just stay quiet. She also told me to stay on the line just in case anything else happens. Also keep in mind that my house is around 15 minutes away from the nearest town. After sitting in my parents' closet, I heard the back door creak. Tears started rolling out as I heard someone walking around in the kitchen in the living room. I told the 911 operator what was happening, then I heard something fall over downstairs. Then I heard the stairs creaking and the man walking around the bedrooms. Thank God I locked the bedroom door because the man saw it was locked and then kept going or so I thought. After around 30 seconds, I heard the loudest bang with a man screaming. After this, I then heard police sirens and the man running away and the back door slamming shut. I ran out of the room to see him running into the woods. I ran out and told the cops everything that happened and they took me to my aunt's house while I waited for my parents to come home. Since I never actually saw the man and can get a good description of him, the man was never caught. I never did have another experience like this again though, so I'm at least glad for that. So this happened to my mom a couple years before I was born, around 2004. She was at the mall one day when she met a man. He seemed nice initially, and when he asked her to come back to his place to watch movies, she was cool with it. They got back to his place, which was a one-room apartment on the second floor. It was a pretty depressing place from the way she described it. It was just a mattress on the ground with a TV set up across the room. He went into the corner and did something my mom couldn't see while she sat on his bed. When the guy turned around, the irises in his eyes were completely black. My mom can't explain it, but she thinks it's drug-related. 
This really freaked her out, but she didn't mention it. Instead, she asked him what movie he wanted to watch. Without responding back, he sat down next to her, wrapped an arm around her chest, squeezed, and then pulled her back on top of him. My mom had escaped a similar scenario years prior by tricking her assailant into thinking she was okay with everything so that she could make a break for it and use the same exact strategy as she had then. She asked the guy if she could smoke a little marijuana before they did anything to make it more fun. He agreed and she set up her pipe. She didn't take that much because she still needed to be sober enough to resist it, but she tried to exaggerate it to make herself seem high as a kite. She then told him, Oh, I always smoke a cigarette after I do pot. Can I step outside really quick? I really hate secondhand smoke. He reluctantly agreed, and she stood about a foot away from his door. She started looking around, trying to figure out if she could make a run for it, when the man then lunged at her, grabbed her so hard the breath was forced from her lungs, pulled her inside and then shut the door, standing in front of it. She was terrified. She was almost 30 at the time but she was very small. She had a backup plan though. She pulled out her keychain, which had a weird looking laser pointer that she got from work on it. She held that up and then said in her most convincing voice, don't fucking make me use this. And by some miracle, he let her go finish her cigarette. The second she got outside, she bolted to her car and she almost closed the door before he blocked it. They stayed just like that for about 45 minutes. I also want to mention that this was in East Austin in the early 2000s, and there wasn't a lot going on. Next to the apartments, there was a huge empty field with really tall grass. As my mom was looking around praying that someone would find them, the guy kept looking back from my mom to the field to my mom to the field, and repeatedly begging her, Just come back inside, please. I promise I'm not going to hurt you. And she knew she was going to end up dead in that field if she moved at all. The guy got some stroke of impulse, and he shoved his tongue all the way down my mom's throat. By another miracle, someone pulled into the parking lot, and my mom then said, If you don't get the fuck off me right this second, I'm either going to run you over or crash into that car. And either way, I'm getting their attention. This managed to scare him off of her for a second, and she took that opportunity to then speed home as fast as she could. When she finally got back home, she told her roommate everything that happened, and he told her to call the police. But at that time, she was way too traumatized to do anything other than go to bed. The next day, though, she thought about it, and she didn't want another woman, or God forbid my sister, who was about 10 at the time, to end up in that field or with that man. She told the police everything that happened, leaving out the weed part out of worry and she came to find out that he was on their most wanted list for committing a number of sexual crimes, both in Utah as well as Texas. She testified in court and was able to put him in jail. Unfortunately though, it was only for a couple of years before he got out on a plea bargain. She seen him in grocery stores a couple times after he got out, but very thankfully, he never tried anything with her again. I'm a 24-year-old female, and I live alone with my one-year-old son. I've been living in an apartment complex for seven years or more, and I always really keep to myself, so I've never really had any problems here, but one night after I went to sleep, I was woken up by a very loud bang on my door, and just to let you know, I was sleeping on the couch this night. This was at two in the morning. After I woke up, I sat on the couch for a minute and wondered if it was just maybe the upstairs neighbors, because they're always really loud and stomp. But after about a minute, I heard yet another loud bang on my door. I say bang because I don't really know how else to describe it. It was actually so hard that it was like whoever was on the other side of the door either kicked the door or threw their shoulder into it to try and bust it down. After hearing it a second time, I got up and went to the door and looked out the peephole. I didn't really see anybody at first, but I then see this man walking from the left and he walked right up to my door. He starts trying to turn the knob to open the door. I immediately yell out at him, you better get the fuck out of here. He looked really surprised, almost like he wasn't expecting someone to be at the door. He then ran off. He had black hair and he had a light gray hoodie with the hood up. I've never seen him there before. 
I was honestly so scared after that happened that I called the cops. But I told them not to send someone to my apartment, just look around the apartment complex to find him. I wasn't able to open my door for anybody after that. It just scared me so bad. I wasn't even able to go back to sleep that night. I ended up staying up for the rest of the night, and when it finally got to daylight, I finally felt safe enough to have a cop come to my apartment. I asked the cops to go look at the cameras, but they said they couldn't do anything unless he actually got in my apartment or broke my door. I was so pissed off about this. I mean, what if he came back and did get in that time? Or what if he had got in that night? I probably wouldn't have been alive to call the cops. I don't even want to think about what he would have done if he got in. The thing that I really think about the most is out of all the apartments in the building or out of the buildings in the complex, for whatever reason, he came to my door and he came to the door twice. The first time he either kicked it, or like I said, he threw his shoulder into it as hard as he could, and I honestly believe the second time was to come back to the door to see if what he did either loosened up the door or maybe broke it open. I'm just really glad nothing else happened. To start this story, I'm a female, and I'd just gotten out of a four-year relationship. I point this out because it relates to a later part of the story. Anyway, me and my boyfriend were living together and he's the one who decided to end our relationship. He moved out and I stayed. The lease happened to be in my name, so I didn't really want to lose my deposit. I was really so messed up though over this breakup. I thought I was never going to get over this guy. I finally did get over him though and saw what an idiot he actually was. He was going out on me in the later part of our relationship, and of course I was the last one to find out. My friend needed a place to stay, so she moved in. I really liked the idea of shared rent so that I could have some extra money as well. The friend eventually introduced me to a couple of her guy friends. She really didn't have any female friends, so I eventually introduced my girlfriends to them and we all just started hanging out. These two guys were in a band. They would play local pubs. They were actually pretty good. Me and the girls would watch them play and dance. Afterwards, we would all hang out for a bit. One night, I could sense one of the guys kind of flirting with me. Let's call him Joe. Word was getting back to me that he wanted to go out with me. I didn't really want to date anyone at that time, though as I was still getting over my ex. If my ex would have asked me to go back to him, I probably would have done it in a heartbeat. So Joe and I were just friends like we all were. He actually really respected the fact that I wasn't interested, and he never made a pass at me. Until one really hot summer night. I had gotten home after dark that night, and I was really tired and ready for bed. My roommate called and said not to lock the door because she didn't have her key. She said that she was on her way and that she'd probably be home in about 10 minutes. I left the door wide open with the screen door shut and I went to bed. I remember waking up to something biting my ear. I sleepily touched my throbbing earlobe. I was lying on my left side and I felt my right elbow bump into flesh behind me. I then turned over to see what was behind me. My room was semi-dark because I had a small table lamp that I always kept on when I slept. I hate to sleep in total darkness to this day. Well, what my elbow ended up hitting was Joe's chest. He was also lying on his left side and he had been spooning me. He was what bit my ear. Joe had obviously been drinking. He reeked of stale cologne and alcohol. I said to him, Joe, what the hell are you doing? He smiled a drunken smile, then said, Oh, come on. You know you want me. I yelled to him that I absolutely didn't want him and told him to leave. By this time, I had sat up on the edge of my bed with my back towards him. He told me through gritted teeth that he wasn't leaving. Because it was so hot, I had on a tank top with just my underwear. Joe had then started pulling at the back of my underwear. Now at first, I really wasn't that scared. I was more pissed off than anything but then the anger turned into fear. Joe was a big guy. He lifted weights incessantly, and I was absolutely no match for him. 
I then stood up and started running out of the apartment out the back door. I didn't know where I was going, but I had to get away from him. Thank God, my roommate and a guy friend were walking up the driveway. Right away, I told them what happened. Her guy friend went to talk to Joe while me and my roommate stayed outside. He came back and told us that he was passed out cold. Great, just great. We called a couple of Joe's friends to come and get him. They then came over and carried him into the back of one friend's car. Joe's friends drove him home. Nothing was ever mentioned about that night again. We all knew about it, but we all just kind of chalked it up to Joe being drunk. But Joe couldn't look me in the eye after that, and I'm sure he felt my hatred towards him. Eventually my lease was up, and me and my roommate moved out. I found a place closer to my job, and she left state. So the group of friends just kind of split up and was no more. I still had my small group of girlfriends though, but after that night, my door was always locked. Even if my roommate didn't have the key to get in, I wasn't taking any chances anymore. So I was 18 years old at this point in my life, and I'm now 22. I lived with my now ex-boyfriend, who I'll refer to as JJ, and I lived in a three-bedroom apartment with his sister, who I'll refer to as C her boyfriend R, and their little girl that I consider to be my niece. She was two to three years old at this time. Now, this apartment always really gave me the creeps. The air felt thick, and I would always have some kind of weird anxiety being alone there. C and her boyfriend R were kind of into Satanism. I don't know if they practiced it regularly, but they had these weird tapestries hanging around the house. They also had some kind of altar in their room. They weren't very clean people at all. The sink would always be overrun with lots of dishes, and the counters were always covered with old food containers. This eventually led to the apartment being completely infested with cockroaches. That being said though, I always kept mine and Jay's room very clean. I would order food most of the time and eat it in our room. Just basically spend the majority of my time in there. There had always been some really weird things that would happen in this apartment. I would hear random bangs or noises that I just chalked up to one of the neighbors being loud. I would also like to add that this is the only house that I've ever astral projected in. I don't know if that's relevant, but I just find it kind of strange. There was this one night close to Halloween where we were all in the living room carving pumpkins. Me being an artist, I chose a very ambitious design for my pumpkin. It was a very scary and demonic looking face. I was almost done with it when I suddenly had a full-on anxiety attack. In that moment, I had just completely been terrified of my pumpkin, and I didn't even want to finish carving it. It's kind of stupid, but I also really love creepy things, so I really don't know why my own drawing had this effect on me. It was just really weird. There was another day I was at the apartment completely alone. Everyone had ran to the store together, and I decided to stay home. C had just cleaned the apartment, and it was in the middle of the day, so I decided to just hang out in the living room and watch the cable. My niece had a few toys scattered around the floor, and there was one on the end table right next to where I was sitting. This toy was one of those weird talking toys that you could program to say your kid's name. I had a really uneasy feeling. I tried my best to just shove it aside and ignore it. I just assumed I was being paranoid from all my previous experiences I've had there. Anyways, I was sitting there watching TV for about 10 minutes when the toy next to me suddenly goes off and then says, Here I am! in a really cheerful little girl's voice. Now I'm not gonna lie, it scared the absolute crap out of me, but I tried to explain it away in my head. I was pretty much just sitting there pretending not to be scared when about 15 to 20 seconds later it goes off again and then says, Hello, can you see me? Hell no. This time I noped the fuck out of there. I then ran to my room and turned on cartoons. When everyone got home, I went back out into the living room to shake the toy and then move it around just to see if it would easily go off on its own. It didn't. When I told C about this, she actually told me that she had never heard that toy use those phrases before. Then I started thinking about it. Why would a little kid's toy even be programmed to say that stuff? 
C then proceeded to tell me that she thinks there's some sort of entity attached to R, that she had also experienced some strange things in this apartment, and their previous one as well. Needless to say, I'm really, really glad I don't live there anymore. I have only recently remembered this story after having blacked it out for about three years. I was 25 years old and living in Los Angeles in a really big apartment complex. One day at the apartment gym, a man had started talking to me while I was working out. He seemed a little off, but I thought he may have a mental disability based on his behavior. So I just responded to him politely and went about my workout. At this point, there were several other people in the gym and in the vicinity. I didn't really think much of it. Cut to maybe about 15 to 20 minutes later, the gym's cleared out. It's now nighttime, maybe around 9 p.m. I'm on the treadmill running and the man re-enters the gym with an FBI hat and badge around his neck. He's holding something in his hands. I think it's handcuffs, but I'm not 100% sure. He tells me that I'm going with him as I'm under arrest for making hand gestures. I'm absolutely terrified at this point and feel extremely vulnerable as I'm literally just running on a treadmill. Mind you, I'm 5'1 and around 100 pounds, so I don't really know what to do or how to get away. I don't really know how much time went by, as I'm still working to piece together the story since I remembered it a little over a year ago. To be completely honest, I didn't even remember how I got out of the situation. My husband actually had to remind me a lot of the details, but thankfully at some point during that encounter, a woman came into the gym, so I got off the treadmill and then ran back to my apartment to call the police. I had my husband walk over to the gym just to make sure the guy still wasn't there and going after the other woman as well. He was gone though. The police showed up and only mildly cared. Gotta really love living in a big city. However, our apartment building cared and they were able to identify the man based on the surveillance video. I assume he was immediately evicted as I never saw him again after that. The leasing manager said she knew who did it before they even saw the tape and he had apparently been a big problem for a while now. It was pretty creepy. In 2017, in my last semester of high school, some friends and I decided to skip the pep rally for the girls varsity basketball team making the playoffs for the first time. My last period of the day was theater tech. I was really just taking it as a fine arts credit, and two of my friends in the grade below me were in that class with me. We decided to skip the pep rally, leave school early, and go to the nearby Taco Bell like we did every day. However, administrators and security guards patrolled the parking lots to catch kids trying to skip, so we took a detour instead through the nature trail on campus in order to avoid them. Once in the nature trail, we would came across this kid that I hadn't seen before. He was a skinny white kid with shaggy black hair, wearing baggy jeans, and a plain white t-shirt. He was shorter than me, but the most notable thing about him was his general look of dishevelment. His hair was really wild and full of leaves and twigs. His plain white t-shirt was dirty, and the knees of his jeans were stained green and brown. He actually seemed like he had been crawling around in the nature trail. I remember wondering for a split second if maybe he lived there. When we came upon him, we were walking in one direction parallel to the school and to the back of the parking lot, and he was coming directly toward us. I knew the nature trail well enough to know that there was a bend that led deep into the woods, and I figured he had come from there. He was out of breath, and he looked scared. My two friends said hi to him. My friends were in the grade below me, and later told me that the kid was in their grade, and was just acquaintances with my two friends. It was really just supposed to be a quick hello, but I couldn't help but notice how scared he looked, and how suspicious he seemed of us. He asked us what we were doing in the woods, and we told him we were skipping the pep rally. One of my friends then asked, What have you been doing out here? Camping? Me and my other friend kind of gave a nervous laugh, but the kid didn't even crack a smile. He explained that he was dropped off at school that morning, and he was supposed to get on a bus to take him to DAEP. Now, DAEP was the alternative school that kids who got suspended from school had to go to. Now his plain outfit started to make sense now. It was the infamous uniform of that alternative school. He then explained that he didn't want to go to the alternative school, 
So when his mom dropped him off, he pretended like he would wait for the bus and then hid in the nature trail for the full eight hours of the school day. He was still acting really skittish and without even looking at each other or speaking to each other. My friends and I could just feel that something definitely wasn't right and that we were in some kind of danger. The kid looked around nervously often as if someone might have followed us or if we were alone in the woods. We hit him with a, all right man, well good luck. We're going to try to get to our cars and go home before the pep rally ends. When he heard the word cars, he perked up. He started slowly walking with us towards the parking lot, continuing to talk. He becomes a lot more friendly now and asks if we can give him a ride home. We give him some half-baked excuse why we couldn't, but he doesn't really take no for an answer. He tells us that people are going to start looking for him pretty soon and that he was going to be in a lot of trouble if he doesn't get out of there. We tell him that he'd probably be fine hiding there deep in the nature trail, but he then just tells us, Nah man, you don't understand. I broke into a car at the fellowship. He pointed in the direction of the mega church that had a parking lot backed up to my school, then saying, I took this. From his waistband, he then pulled out a handgun, and I felt sick to my stomach. I had never seen a real gun like that in real life. At this point, I really felt like I was in danger. Not just because he had produced a gun. I had never really been scared of them. More so that the entire interaction just felt really uneasy. And that the guy was already unsettling and desperate to begin with. One of my friends then very cautiously tells him that he should probably just ditch it and take off somewhere. And he just stood there staring at us for a really uncomfortable amount of time. His eyes meeting each of ours. I broke the silence by saying that we wouldn't tell anyone. But that we really had to go before the pep rally ended. And then my other stupid ass friend who had been virtually silent the entire time then spoke up and said, Yeah, and it's really best we're not around if they start looking for you for that, pointing to the handgun. His eyes narrowed once more and he asked if one of us could take him home. This time, however, it felt more like a command. I've never really been a super brave person, but in that moment, I don't know why. I just blurted out, Nah, man, I'm good. And again, there was a really uncomfortable silence. Then he asked, Before you leave, do you guys want to see something? My first friend was kind of a hothead, and although he was really uncomfortable with the situation, he wasn't afraid of conflict, nor was I. My other friend, however, wasn't a fan of conflict, and would almost always de-escalate first. We all looked at each other, and me and my first friend kind of had an unspoken understanding. Like if this was really going to happen, or if we were going to have to run or fight. My other friend was very visibly afraid. He asked, What is it that you want to show us? And before the kid could answer, my first friend then said, We don't want to see it. We have to go. My first friend started briskly walking past the kid, and me and my other friend quickly followed. Within a few steps, we just started sprinting towards the parking lot. I decided to look back once we were about 50 steps away. As I looked back, he was still just standing there, watching us run. He put the gun back in his waistband before taking a small adjacent trail back deeper into the woods. By the time we made it to the parking lot, there were police everywhere. We were sweating out of breath and absolutely terrified from everything that happened. They ended up finding the kid within the next 10 minutes. Somehow in the chaos, nobody saw us exit the nature trail and into the parking lot. But since there were so many cops in the parking lot, we decided to just head back inside through another side door, only to find out that the door was locked. That's when an administrator had found us, brought us inside, and then shoved us into a classroom where we were able to talk with the others and find out what was going on. This is what we could piece together from what we learned. Turns out that the kid had skipped DAEP, hid in the nature trail, broke into a car at the church, and then stole a semi-automatic shotgun and handgun from the car. After stealing the guns, he texted his girlfriend and he told her he was about to do something really terrible and that whenever she saw his name on the news, she should turn off the TV. He told her explicitly that he was going to kill all the kids at school. She knew that he was supposed to be in DAUP and she was so worried about the text that she contacted the police. DAUP went on lockdown until officers got a call from a guy at church that had two guns that had been stolen from his car behind the school. And that's when they put two and two together and caught him hiding in the woods. I guess when he saw me and my two friends in the nature trail, he quickly hid the shotgun, but just didn't have enough time to hide the pistol. That or he just didn't care enough to hide. Whatever the case, 
I'm just really, really glad me and my friends got out alive that day. Who the fuck really knows what could have happened if we actually gave them a ride or stayed behind with them. It was a typical boring day in history, learning about Qing Dynasty stuff, though it was our last two weeks of school before summer. Our school had a policy not to give tests anymore during the last week or two of the school year, but this section's teacher decided to break this rule and give his class a five-page English test. Good thing for us, our teacher was the chill type, so he decided to make a game in Kahoot about the past topics this school year. Anyways... It was about 40 minutes until our teacher then got a call, and we thought it was just his family and stuff. But then I saw the look on his face, and I'll never forget this moment in my life. The teacher then shouted, Guys, quick, close the door and barricade all the doors with your tables and chairs. And all of you be quiet. Don't no one shout or cry, got it? We did all of his instructions, and our principal's voice came through the loudspeaker, and then said, This is a lockdown. I repeat, this is a lockdown. There's six active shooters that have entered the building, armed with very high-powered armory and guns. Our principal was still about to say more things, but the announcement was abruptly stopped. My friend from another school had texted me and asked me if I'm okay. Apparently, it wasn't only six active shooters, but it was ten. My friend also said that the SWAT had surrounded our school, but they couldn't go inside since they received an anonymous text that they have 40 students and 5 teachers hostage, and if they came inside, they would kill all of them. All of my girl classmates were crying, telling all their friends how they still want to live. They didn't stop for two hours when we heard rapid gunshots. Apparently the SWAT broke in and killed 5 of the active shooters roaming the hall, but when the other 5 shooters heard the gunshots, they then killed 15 students, including one substitute teacher. The lockdown lasted for about 7 hours, when the SWAT finally killed all the other 5 shooters in the room. The very next day, we all held a vigil for the families of the 16 people who died in the school shooting. Summer was called early, and the school went into some major renovations to upgrade their security, so that this very sad moment in the school's history will never happen again. And I really pray to God that it doesn't. The story takes place when I was in about 3rd or 4th grade, in a really decent sized urban area. Me and a couple of my friends were just goofing off at recess one day, and we see a ton of police cars go flying down the street next to the basketball court where we were playing at, and then stop right in front of a house about a block up the street. Then all of a sudden the bell rang to the corresponding code for a lockdown, and the principal came over the intercom telling everyone it's a real lockdown and definitely not a drill. I can still remember to this day just all the kids starting to freak out. No one knew what was going on, and all the kids that were on the blacktop kept getting asked what was going on. Because the way the school was situated, the blacktop area was on the other side of the building, so the street where the cops drove by wasn't in view of the rest of the playground. We ended up staying in lockdown for the whole rest of the day. The parents were told to come get their kids who walked home, and no one even knew what happened until later that night. I was in the living room with my parents and they were watching the news when I then heard exactly what happened. There was a man in the house where the cops had stopped at who was in the second story holding someone hostage with a hunting rifle. He had a standoff with the police for hours before finally taking his own life. This incident has always really bothered me, knowing just how close I was to the situation and seeing the start of it, and it's definitely something I will never forget. This happened when I was in middle school. Now, this might not be as scary as what you're used to, but it did really freak me out. So, you know how schools typically have those troublemaker students? Well, one of them took it just a bit too far. It was on a Thursday, and I was in math class when I had overheard two students talking. I'm not normally one to eavesdrop, but what they had said really gave me the chills. One said that his friend was planning on coming to school with a gun. I didn't really believe this, so I tried to brush it off. But throughout the day, I noticed some of the students and even teachers looking like they were having a panic attack. Then the principal announced to the speaker that apparently a student had come to the office threatening to pull out a gun on them. That's when I then realized the conversation was real. My math teacher then locked the door, and we all went quiet. Some time had passed and the speaker came back on, saying that the student didn't really have a gun, and they let us all go home early. 
I don't know what happened to the student that caused this, but I really, really hope he got suspended. Like I said, I know this really wasn't that scary, but it absolutely gave me the chills. I mean, I can't even imagine what would have happened if this was real. People should never joke about shooting someone, especially in a school. I went to a small school in Ohio. It was actually the second smallest school in the state. It was a winter day and I was in the 8th grade, I believe. I was sitting in class and I heard one of my classmates, who we'll call E, then speak up about what happened in his third period math class. He said that a kid in his class, who we'll call T, said that another kid, who we'll call C, had been threatened to shoot up the school. I was so scared by this that I thuttered as the thought of huddling in a dark corner of a classroom and running for my life then entered my mind. It was also a Friday night, which meant that boys basketball was in complete action in a game. It was also a home game, which meant that I had to go perform for the pep band. I didn't really mind that though. I loved band, and I loved being able to go out every Friday and Saturday night to have some fun with the upperclassmen who let me hang around them. My mom was driving me to school and I just couldn't get the thought of running for my life out of my head from earlier today. My mom noticed me doing this and she had asked me what was wrong. I broke down in tears and I told her that someone at the school had heard that someone was going to shoot it up. She was so worried for me and she assured me that everything would be okay and that she'd email the principal about it. I'd just finished up from pet band, so I went back to the band room to put away my instrument and then have some fun before my mom came and picked me up. While I was sitting there watching the game, I had heard the principal call me to come with her. I went with her out the back door into the snow, and I was shivering from the cold. She asked me about what happened earlier today, and I told her everything that he told me in my class. She thanked me for telling her, and she'd said she'd look into the matter with the help from the local police. She said that if it wasn't for me telling her, we would have probably faced major tragedy and very possibly lots of death. I thought that I had done a great deed and saved many lives that day. And I did. The next day at school and onwards, I never saw C in the school ever again. So I guess he really was planning to shoot up the school. I still can't believe that if it wasn't for me, so many people could have died that day. It's crazy. So this happened when I was in elementary school, and it was around 4th or 5th grade. I was really excited for the day because, of course, it was hat day. Which is when you bring a dollar and give it to the teacher, and you can wear your hat for the day. So the day went pretty normal. Went to breakfast, had specials, went to class, etc. All that fun stuff. Now the best time of the day came around. Lunch. So I was really excited because we go to recess after lunch, but I was also super hungry. So anyways, I get in line, get my food, pay, and sit down with some of my friends. Probably about 20 minutes or so goes by, and I was done with my food and kind of just sitting there chatting with my friends. Well, another 10 minutes go by, and I'm starting to get a little worried because we're staying a little longer there than usual. So I decided to get up to ask a teacher what's going on. The teacher just said she's sorry and she doesn't really know herself. Another three minutes go by and the principal comes down and tells all the teachers to shut the cafeteria doors. Everyone's kind of freaking out a bit, but not a lot. They're just kind of confused on what's happening. The principal then comes in the cafeteria and then says, Listen everyone, pay attention. We're going on a soft lockdown, so please everyone stay in your seats and do not get up. Nobody is to be let out into the halls. And then she left. Around 20 more minutes go by and everyone is still a little freaked out. Some people are even starting to cry. So I'm basically talking with friends and chatting with people around me, trying to keep my mind off of what's happening. When the teachers then start to close the blinds on all the windows. The intercom starts up again and then says, Look everyone, we're going on a hard lockdown. Stay where you are. Everyone is totally freaking out now. An hour goes by, and now half of the people are crying. I'm being a little dramatic bitch, and I basically start writing on a paper about if I don't make it out alive, I love you type things. And so I'm literally having like a mental breakdown while half of the place is crying. I decide to get up and ask the teacher what's going on, and what she then told me absolutely sent chills down my spine. There's people who are saying they're going to start a school shooting, 
They're protesting outside the school, and police are outside as well. I literally just froze. I run back over to my seat and then tell all the people around me what's happening and just start hugging everyone, thinking this might be the last time that I'm ever going to see them or my parents again. After what feels like a hundred hours, probably just one more hour in reality, and the intercom comes back on. They're saying that we're now on a soft lockdown again. I'm still crying my eyes out and hugging my friends. Another 40 minutes pass, and the lockdown is now finally over. We survived. Everyone is still kind of crying, but they're a bit more happy and stuff. So it takes us about 20 minutes to get out of the cafeteria. We eventually get out, and everyone's moms and dads are there to pick them up. I'm going into the classroom, just trying to think what the hell happened. After about 30 or 40 minutes of waiting while crying, my mom finally shows up. I hugged her the tightest that I've ever hugged anyone in my life and then went home. I was telling my mom what happened all the way home. I even later heard that they were apparently going to come back on Wednesday and then shoot up the school then. Well, as you can imagine, I didn't go to school that Wednesday. Yet nothing ever happened. I was still absolutely traumatized from this event. If you're the person that almost did this to us, I truly hope that we never meet. I really hope you burn in hell for traumatizing a 10 year old girl who just wanted to wear a hat that day. You sick awful fuck. So a little bit of background for my story. I'm a driver for Lyft and I'm a 27 year old female. This happened when I was 26. It also happened to be on Halloween night as the money should have been really great. So story time. So I usually start in the town next to mine. It's only 20 minutes away. On the way there, I get the notification that Mike needs a ride. His pickup area was odd, but still within town limits. I didn't think twice, and I accepted it. His pickup was at a well-known bank. I thought it was odd. It was 11pm, and the banks closed hours ago. I sent a notification to the customer, letting him know I was there in the yellow car. I waited about two minutes, and he knocked on my window, asking if I was Katie. I said yes, and I told him to hop in and buckle up. And he did. He was an older man, and he had some food with him, as well as a backpack, which he had put both at his feet. We head out to his destination, and at first, he really seemed perfectly fine. He did ask me to pull over so he could call his friends and make sure that they were home just in case. Now, honestly, I really don't mind doing this kind of thing, as I know how to handle myself if anything went wrong, but I don't think I saw him call anyone. His phone wasn't dialing out. He just put it up to his ear and said no one answered, so I head back on the road as I wasn't going to wait around forever. I got back on the road, and at the next stoplight, he had asked to see my hands. I figured he wanted to see if my nails were done or something. I said that I'm sorry, but I'd prefer not to, as I really don't like being touched. Not a minute goes by that he asks another question. So I was wondering, can I show you something? Now I'm a nice girl, and I don't see anything wrong with friendliness, so I then respond back with, what, what is it? As I look over, I see this man has exposed himself while also groping himself. Now at this point I'm scared as I'm a girl and with a complete stranger. I then went on to tell him to put himself away or I was going to call the cops. I didn't want to aggravate him though in case he decided to attack me or worse. Luckily there was a gas station just across from the road from the stoplight. I pulled in and I asked him to get the fuck out of my car. That if he didn't, I was going to pepper spray him. He did get out of my car but not without calling me a few select words. Now I did call the cops and give his description and the locations of the pickup and drop off and which way he went. I'll never forget this night as it always serves as a learning lesson for safety for myself and others. I'm very happy to say that I now own a dash cam as well as a firearm for protection. To all the female rideshare drivers out there, always be safe and listen to your gut. It may save your sanity. Hey 
Hey everyone, apologies for the brief interruption on the stories, but I just want to take a small moment to thank today's sponsor, Paint Your Life. When I heard about PaintYourLife.com, I thought that it was a really good idea for maybe birthdays or anniversaries or weddings. With Paint Your Life, you can get a professional hand-painted portrait created from any photo at an affordable price. It's also really fast. You can receive your portrait in as little as two weeks. It's very meaningful and personal and can be cherished forever. I actually personally used Paint Your Life and I really was blown away by the quality of the painting. So if you're into art and maybe you have a photo of someone or some place that's really special to you, I definitely think you should try Paint Your Life. At PaintYourLife.com, there's no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded, guaranteed. And right now is a limited time offer. Get 20% off your painting. That's right, 20% off and free shipping. To get this special offer, text the word TABLE to 64000. That's TABLE to 64000. Text TABLE to 64000. Paint your life. Celebrate the moments that matter most. Terms apply. Available at paintyourlife.com slash terms. All right, let's get back into the stories. I work in food service, front of the house. So in the early days of the pandemic with restaurants closed, I was taking work wherever I could find it. An old friend of mine had clued me into a medical office that needed someone to come in and do a bit of light filing. I was able to go in at night to limit direct contact with people. So I jumped at the opportunity right away. Ironically, the medical office job had been the safest gig that I'd been offered thus far. I mean, COVID-wise anyways. I wanted to avoid the bus if I could, due to crowds. So I decided to swing for a rideshare app. It's not all that expensive in my area, and I really didn't want the virus. I headed in at almost 3 a.m. because it was after the cleaning crew had left. I was really kicking myself for being so cautious though, because I was exhausted. I stumbled onto the block looking for my ride and to my tired self great relief, the car had spotted me almost immediately and then pulled up asking, Uber? While I coolly wandered up and down the street searching. The ride was taking a while, but I had only just moved here last year, so I'm not really familiar with all the surrounding areas, and I thought nothing of it. I was pretty alert at first, so I was trying to pass the time playing games on my phone and stuff, but the car didn't have a compatible phone charger and I wasn't sure the building would have one, so I wanted to save my battery to be able to call a ride back. I shut my phone down into airplane mode, and I eventually drifted off from a combination of tiredness and boredom. Now, I don't often even take ride share, so being alone with a strange driver often put me a bit on edge. But this guy had a pretty boring car and a very standard look about him. He looked a little like my brother even, Young, clean-kept, listening to jazz. You know, nothing that really screamed that you need to micromanage this trip. When we arrived, the driver tried to wake me up by calling to me from the front. But I was in too deep of a sleep, and I couldn't fully distinguish it from my dream. Finally, he awkwardly jimmied my leg to wake me up, and then kept saying, Ma'am, ma'am, we're here now. I was a little embarrassed that I'd been that out of it. So I just gave it a hurried, thanks, and then booked it out of the car and into the building. As I looked around, I began to realize that nothing was what I expected of an office park. I had seen a street view of the building when I first looked up the business, and it had appeared to be a strip mall plaza. The further I went, the more loudly alarm bells were ringing in my gut. The structure was semi-dilapidated, and it was pitch black dark past the entryway. Now, I expected some of the lights to be off in the nighttime, but I mean, not the whole building. I skidded across the concrete foundation, comprising what was left of the lobby area, told myself they must just be renovating, and followed signs for the stairs. After what felt like ages, but was most likely just a few minutes, all I had passed was construction equipment, a couple of long doors, and some smashed windows. 
I was pretty certain that I wasn't going to find a medical office and figured that maybe I'd mixed up the address. I took out my phone to double check, but once I got it out of airplane mode, I could barely get a signal. I kept moving around in the building, pacing, looking for a stronger signal. I eventually confirmed in my text that I had indeed written down the correct address just by scrolling back, which didn't require service. Since I had only been inside for a few minutes at most, I figured I should try and get in touch with the driver. Because if I entered the correct address, then it was only fair that he should continue my ride to the correct place and save me the added fees of calling a second trip, considering this was all his mix-up. The app was taking forever to load with my slow service, but before I could get a cloud of reception, I heard a rustling sound in the lower level of the building. I was on the top floor, and the only stairwell I was aware of was the one that I had taken up, so it would force me in the middle of the building. So there was no way to exit the situation, not without encountering whoever was downstairs. In an abandoned building in the latest hours of the night, I figured the chances were high that it was a tweaker, and I had no desire to try slipping past a tweaker, especially when it was late enough that they were probably on something, so jumpy and on edge. I tried to get a text out to a group of my friends with my address, and a request to call 911 to help get me from the property, because I didn't feel safe walking in that neighborhood at night, and I didn't have enough reception to call for a new ride. But the message wasn't sending. Reception was too weak. So I gave up on getting my phone going and started checking for another stairwell, or even windows with balconies, or dumpsters that could be used to exit the second floor as a last resort, in the event that whoever was downstairs came upstairs. I scrambled over to a door with a stair sign on it, but the stairs were completely dilapidated, and it was essentially just a straight drop down to the first floor. At that point, the worst case scenario began to unfold. I heard whoever was downstairs begin making their way up the stairs. I thought fast, and I figured based on my walk about the floor, it was basically a giant loop. So I would have to wait for whoever this was to come up the stairs, wait for them to come all the way up, and then sprint the opposite direction of wherever they were going, and try and get down the stairs and out of the building in time to make it to the road without encountering them. I wasn't anticipating being chased or anything, but I didn't want to piss off a druggie or have a homeless person who might have been living there feel as though I'd trespassed and then become hostile towards me, or have any sort of interaction that could possibly occur at that hour in a creepy ass abandoned industrial park. I held my breath for what felt like five minutes, but was likely closer to just 30 seconds, and the person appeared at the top of the stairs. To my great relief, it was just the Uber driver. I figured that he had come back for me, realizing that he had left me in the wrong spot, a place that could have worked out to be dangerous. So I then came out from the beam that I was hidden behind and started to wave him down. But then I processed. There was no way for him to realize this had been the wrong address. My stomach lurched forward and my blood chilled to slush. I made eye contact with him very briefly and he was completely calm and composed, but breathing pretty heavily and blocking the stairwell down. On a normal rational day as an outside observer, I could think of a dozen innocent reasons why he might have returned. But in the moment, standing across from him, I just knew in my gut that this was someone with ill intent. I can't remember much more from the ensuing few minutes. Operating solely on muscle memory and instinct, I superman dove for the second stairwell's opening and just let myself fall all the way down to the drop. Thankfully, I don't think he'd seen where I'd gone at first, and though I was in too much pain to know it then, plenty was bruised, but nothing was completely broken. I scrambled up and then threw myself at anything that seemed like it could be the door. It was way too dark to tell, and I was disoriented from the fall, and I wasn't in a calm enough mindset to think to use my phone flashlight. Just before I was able to reach the door, it flew open with a blinding light beaming straight into my eyes. My first thought, though not totally coherent, was, fuck, there's another one of these guys, and I stumbled backwards, trying to find something to hide behind. Before I could, a voice called out. All right, this is the local police department. Everyone get on your knees with your hands in the air. Now, I didn't believe it was the police at first. 
I was in such a fight or flight mode and had already committed to flight that I continued looking for ways to get out. But he kept shining the flashlight right at me as I teetered around and yelled, Hey, I said get on the ground right now. Hands out. Hands where I can see them. He sounded so authoritative that I just automatically did exactly as he asked. He approached me and finally shined the light away from me. It took a second to get my night vision, but once I did, I could see that he really was a police officer. I tried to explain what was happening, but first he started asking me all these questions and that combined with what had just happened and my fear of the driver coming back all snowballed into me being unable to form a single articulate sentence. He was even asking me easy questions like, can you tell me your name? Do you have any knives, needles, or anything that could poke or cut me? Would you rather talk here or outside? And my stunned babbling in response first led him to believe that I was on something. He directed me out to his car, and once I was safely out of the building, I was able to start getting my bearings a little. I sat on the edge of the back seat of the squad car, with the door open facing out, while he stood across from me and asked me the same exact questions yet again. The first thing I could think to ask was, Did my friends call you? What did they tell you? And he explained no. Nobody called him. He was patrolling the area and noticed a car idling outside of the building that's known to be condemned, and nobody's supposed to be inside, and when they are, he knows they're up to no good. He was launching into a speech about how if I'd gone to shoot up or go meet a John, he had resources he could direct me to and that this wasn't an ideal place to do either of those things, and asking if I had somewhere safe to stay that night. But I was kind of stuck on something else he'd said. Finally, it all clicked. The car. I spilled my whole rideshare story in a frantic word vomit. The officer looked around, but the car wasn't there anymore. The officer guessed the guy had driven off while we were talking inside the building. He asked me all the details I remembered, and I told him, but there really weren't many. I'd been too tired when the ride started to track much, but the officer realized that I could pull up my Uber app and get all the information. There wasn't really enough reception there, even outdoors. So we sped down the road, and once I had enough bars, the app roared to life, and I had four missed notifications from Uber. They said, hello, I've arrived, and I don't see you. I'm flashing my hazards. And finally, unfortunately your driver had to cancel. At first, I thought the driver was so cunning as to pick me up while sending these fake messages and canceling so that the GPS wouldn't track us, knowing I wouldn't notice because I was asleep with my phone off and exonerating himself. But instead, I checked the car details, checked again, and it was definitely not the same driver. The person who had originally driven me there had not been my Uber. My driver was somewhere else on the street when this guy pulled up to me. The policeman took my statement and said he'd keep an eye out for the guy, but the best that I could give them to go off of was basically young-looking Caucasian man with brown hair, sideburns, and a goatee, and he drove a four-door sedan. He was wearing a zip-up sweatshirt and maybe had a hood, which is like one of every four guys in this city. I feel so blessed to have survived this near miss. Suffice to say, I don't take rideshare services anymore. Quadruple check your license plate and driver name. You just really never know. I'm a 17 year old girl living in Baltimore, Maryland. For those who don't know, Baltimore hasn't always been the nicest of places to live. Though I've mostly gotten along just fine, and luckily, I no longer live in the city, just right outside of it. You can still expect though that I was raised to be hyper aware of my surroundings and very wary of strangers. At this time, my school had just let me out for spring break and we got the announcement for an extended break due to COVID-19. At the time, I didn't drive and neither my sister or my parents could pick me up. And with all my friends not living near me, I really had no choice but to Uber home. I wasn't new to Ubering to and from school. I've actually always had pretty good experiences with Uber up until this point. 
Either I get the usual quiet, relaxing kind, or I get some really friendly people with interesting conversations. On the day when my driver picked me up, at first, it was perfectly fine. We made some polite conversation, and we actually were getting along just fine. Now keep in mind, there were only two more common routes to take me back to my home. Both routes only took about 15 minutes, and all included very few main roads and mostly back roads. I also have a habit of looking at my Uber driver's phone whenever it's in that little phone holder. As soon as the sky started going off the suggested route, I became immediately more alert. I continued to converse with this guy, acting like I didn't notice a thing still glancing at the GPS on his phone. The entire time he was off route. Then he pulls into the highway. Never once when I had to take an Uber home did I ever need to get onto the highway. Then it got quiet. It wasn't like the conversation just died down naturally. He just stopped answering me. I immediately became nervous. The guy wasn't taking me anywhere near my home. He was actually going down freeways that would have taken me into a whole different state. I immediately texted my friend group chat with what was happening, showing them the guy's profile and everything, texting them that if I don't respond within an hour to any of them, to call the police. I was way too chicken shit to press the safety button on my phone, because I knew it wasn't uncommon for Uber drivers to purposely take super long routes to get more money. Still. I gathered up all my courage and I spoke up to him, letting him know that I was suspicious of him. Excuse me, I'm sorry but is this the right way? All the times I've Ubered, I've never been taken on the highway before, I said to him. Pretty much immediately he started to reassure me that I was safe and he was taking a quicker route. Yeah fucking right. As I mentioned before, a normal trip home would have only taken about 15 minutes maybe even less. I was in the car for nearly half an hour now. Then I tried to call my dad. He didn't answer. So what I did instead was give an Oscar award-winning fake phone call. Hey dad. Yeah, I'm on the highway right now. Yeah, my location is shared with you. Why? Okay. Yep. Yeah, I will. I'll talk to you when I get home. Bye. Love you too. My Uber driver was staring at me for the duration of that entire fake phone call. I hope if he thought my dad knew where I was and that he was expecting me to come home, he would have hopefully not had any ill intentions with me. Right then, suddenly my driver turned into a highway exit and within another 20 minutes, I was on my main road home. I don't think I've ever gotten out of any car so fast in my life. Still though, my dumbass still gave him a decent rating and a tip. I guess because at the time, I truly didn't know if he truly had any ill intentions with me. I mean, it's very likely that he could have just been another Uber driver trying to make an extra buck. And that he did. I nearly got charged $20 more for what I usually had to pay on that trip. I still wish that I had emailed some kind of Uber customer service or something and explained the situation. Needless to say, please stay safe out there when Ubering guys. If your driver ever goes off route for an extended period of time for no apparent reason, make it known that you're aware of it and that you're on to them. It could just very much possibly save your life. Now, the story takes place a few years ago, before the virus hit. I was visiting my aunt in Louisiana when we decided to take the Bloody Mary's Haunted Museum tour. For some context, She's one of the more famous ghost adventurers in the state, as well as being very high rank in voodoo. Forgive me, as I'm not really sure what to call positions in voodoo. Anyways, so my aunt and I got to the place and we started our tour. There had actually been a murder-suicide case in that house, Zach and Addie, if you want to look it up, and it's seriously messed up. While on the tour, we had noticed that there was a room full of dolls, and I'm talking full like everywhere. There had actually been over a hundred dolls in that room, but not including a crawl space in the back. Our tour guide said it was to please young children's spirits. I shake at the side of the dolls and continue with the tour. At the every end of the tour, we were shown haunted objects behind glass, but a very certain one had caught my eye. 
It was a two-foot girl doll with a purple dress with a white flower crown on. That's Winnie, our tour guide said. Well, apparently Winnie was the most active doll spirit they had, and apparently it had even bit one of their employees. Our tour guide strictly instructed us not to taunt her, but I was dumb, and I did what he said not to do. I said to the doll, How about you do something and I'll believe in you? You know, like a fucking idiot. Nothing really happened right away, so I kind of felt a little disappointed about it. Later that night, I had woke up only to not have control of my body. I couldn't talk or move. All I could do was lie down. I couldn't see from my angle, but I could sense someone or something moving around the bed, if that makes sense. The presence would move from my right foot to the left and then repeat. I then started to feel a little warm, then even warmer, until I felt like I was being cooked. I guess when others feel cold with fear, I feel like I'm being baked in it. This went on for God knows how long, but I remember waking up when the sun came up. I instantly ran from that room to the safety of my aunt. It took me a few more years for me to actually apologize to both Bloody Mary and Winnie, but I'm so glad that I did. I definitely learned my lesson not to mess with haunted items again, and if anyone ever goes down to the Haunted Museum in New Orleans, please tell Winnie, Silver says sorry. I used to work part-time at a small non-profit adult home. The building had dated back to over 200 years. It was once a home for troubled women and orphans, then a hospice, and finally in 1896, a home for the elderly. From my first day there, I had heard the stories. The knocking on doors during the night while no camera can catch the culprit. Residents spoke of children being kept hostage in the basement while staff mentioned seeing a young girl in a dress wandering the floor. Shadow figures lingered in the kitchen, and most notoriously, a woman in the white dress who hazed the newbies. No one ever made it more than a month without at least one encounter. I unfortunately have had far more than that though. I could spend paragraphs recounting every ghost that wandered those halls, or I could limit it to the most prevalent four. The woman in the white dress, She's the first most people see. A full body apparition with dark curled hair and an old timely white dress. My mother has seen her face in the attic window and disappear around corners. Now in my case, she scared the absolute hell out of me while I was stocking the drink coolers. I was on the second floor in the oldest section of the building. The halls were quiet and I was sitting on the old musty carpet stocking mini root beers. When I looked up, and there she went across the end of the hallway. She was as real as any other person, but her feet never touched the ground. Then there's the red elevator. This is definitely the most malevolent energy. There's one big red elevator on the newer side of the building. The door will open at random with no one around. Whenever you get on alone, you can just tell something else is there. The car will suddenly grow cold, and this heaviness sets in. Some people will get goosebumps, but otherwise it's alright. I have actually felt a hand around my neck more than once. An inability to breathe and a tightening in my chest. Once the doors open, the feeling will disappear and the presence is gone. Now the basement. People will often say that there's children haunting the basement. Others say it's a past resident who enjoys playing pranks. Regardless, all of the servers were absolutely afraid to enter it. I've never felt the same heaviness as in the elevator leading down. Instead, I've had a chair pull away from the wall, slide several feet, and then stop to face me. Or my papers and salt shakers would often slide off the table with no kind of breeze or explainable cause. But in the end, it only feels like good fun. Lastly though, there's the shadow. I've seen shadows before, but there was something vivid about the one that haunted the kitchen. It would often follow you around and stop to hide behind the cabinets and watch you. I normally ignored it whenever it was around, or at least until the morning. I found it sitting in the dark dining room, only for the resident who normally sat at that table to then go to the hospital later that day. I've since stopped working there, 
but I continue to hear stories of these hauntings from past co-workers. There's no doubt in my mind that that place is extremely haunted. I found the Randonautica app recently. With its promise to lead you on an adventure to an anomaly, I figured with all the strange happenings I keep finding around my hometown, I might as well try it. I decided I'd try to find something I've long dreamed of meeting. A vampire. After channeling my intentions, the directions led me somewhere very familiar. A very large house down the road from my own. But it wasn't the closeness that was notable. It was whose house it was. And for that, we'll take a step back to fall 2020. It was the middle of the pandemic and I was instacarting with my mother for some extra cash. We had a pretty strange order that day. Three gallons of bleach, a pack of American cheese singles, a few salads, and a small jug of milk. Yep, you heard that right. An order so weird it's burnt into my memory. Either that person is compensating hard for their lactose intolerance, or something was up. If you're not familiar with how Instacart works, you don't get the exact address you're delivering to until you finish shopping. We were pretty happy to find that our customer, let's call him T, lived so close to us. It was getting late and he was tipping well, and it'd be a straight shot home. It seemed like a perfect end to the day. From the distance, we always knew that that house was kinda pricey, that we could only dream to afford it. It was a beautiful white mansion with a large wraparound driveway and a really expensive lawn. There was a small private pavilion, a tennis court even. But upon approaching, it wasn't quite as it seemed. The flower beds were overgrown and full of dead foliage. There were dead leaves scattered across the dusty sidewalk. A few rotting pumpkins laid on their sides and not a single car in the driveway or any sign of life in the house. The place honestly looked abandoned. There was a note to leave all the mail and groceries outside the door, and two large gargoyle knockers stood in place of the doorbells. What always seemed to be a perfect getaway home was really just the modern gothic mansion of my dreams. Only some guy I never got to meet lived there with a whole lot of bleach. I kind of forgot about tea for a while, until the next few weeks late in the afternoon, he'd order more bleach. Lots of bleach and very few items other than that. It's been a running joke that he was a vampire. He only had guests at night, never was seen doing yard work, ordered as small amounts of groceries through Instacart to keep up his appearance, and he had the bleach to clean up the mess. My mom thought he was a germaphobe, or maybe even a serial killer. I figured I just wanted to be his roommate. That house was really rad, especially if someone cleaned it up a little. But for some reason, I couldn't help but get a really weird feeling when a year later, I was led to T's front yard when I asked to be led to a vampire. I guess I want to thank Randonautica for confirming my suspicions. Now, before I start this story, I want to thank all the veterans out there. My grandpa served in World War II and liberated the Nazi concentration camp Dachau. My grandpa on my dad's side served in World War II, and both my dad, stepdad, and uncle served in Vietnam. Thank you for your service. Now, the story is in no way talking about the Vietnam War or any of the fallen soldiers, missing soldiers, or Vietnam veterans. This is just my first and only experience at the Vietnam Memorial Wall. It'll all make sense in a few minutes so bear with me. My parents and I were watching the movie Wild America, which is still one of my favorite movies to this day. If you haven't watched it, definitely check it out. It's a pretty good movie. You'll understand why I started the story with the movie Wild America in a few minutes. So there's a part in the movie where the three brothers are at their campsite with a mountain man talking about the cave with a thousand sleeping bears. One of the brothers says, Anytime, mister, you'll see it on TV. The mountain man then replies with, Ain't got no TV. They all start laughing, and the mountain man disappears out of nowhere. The three brothers get up and look around, but the mountain man is nowhere to be seen at all. I remember saying to my mom, That would be a real trip to see that in real life. My mom turns to me and looks at me, and then says, That did happen to us, don't you remember? At the Vietnam Wall in D.C. 
I immediately recalled the memory of that day and it flooded back into my brain like an SR-71 Blackbird flying at 3,002 miles per hour and I remembered it. Holy shit, you're right. I remember that. I replied as my jaw dropped and my mom said, Yeah, remember the random guy who helped us find a few names on the wall? Yeah, tell me again what happened, I said. My mom then goes on to say, Remember, it was blistering hot and we kept drinking cold water and sodas because we were trying to cool down. Oh yeah, but we couldn't, I said. My mom continued. We walked down to the wall and there were very few people there. We were trying to find a few names, but we were having trouble. So this random guy came up to us and he showed us specifically where the names were. My eyes widened as the memories then flooded back to me. You know, I remember that, I replied. Yeah, he helped us, and as soon as we turned around to thank him, he disappeared. We looked around, but nobody matching his description was there. It had really freaked us all out a little, but we just kept going, she said. At this point, I remember almost everything, and then said, Oh yeah, I remember I'm helping you guys, and I kind of looked at him weird because didn't he look just like me? I asked. My mom's eyes then widened, and she then said, Yes. He did look like you. I then told my parents my side of the story. He helped me first, and I kind of just looked at him like, what the hell? Almost doing a double take because he looked exactly like me. I should have said something about it, but I didn't want to sound weird or crazy. But still, he looked exactly like me. I remember him saying something to me. I think it was about the war in Vietnam and how important it was to see the Vietnam Memorial and how we should always honor the men who served in the war in Vietnam. I started mustering my courage up, and I was about to say something to him. Not about the war, but about him looking just like me. But he was gone. I remember looking over at you guys and saw him. I thought, oh man, they're going to think it's me and say something about it. I looked at the wall again for not even 15 seconds, and there definitely wasn't enough time for him to run without anyone else noticing. But when I looked back at you guys... He was gone, like a ghost. The guy even sounded like me. Do you guys remember what he was wearing? My mom then said, Pretty much what you wear. Blue hoodie, blue jeans, your age, blue plaid shirt, blonde hair, and glasses. I swear right now, the laugh and the song that played in that part of Wild America just keeps playing over and over in my head right now, and even when we were talking about this. My mom then looked at my stepdad, and he said the same exact description as my mom had said. And I said, Yeah, that's right. Weird, huh? My mom replied. I said, Yeah, I remember feeling kind of creeped out by it, but not really scared. Yeah, me too. My mom replied. We never saw the guy again. The rest of that trip, we were just walking around and seeing all the sights. And pretty much everything after that, for the most part, was normal. The reason why the title of my story is Ghost at the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C., or me, is because ever since we talked about that day, I don't really know who the guy was. Whether he was a ghost, or if we were somehow caught into some sort of time loop, or if I somehow in the future traveled through time and helped myself and my parents out, reminding me of how important it was to see the Vietnam War Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C., and how we should always honor the men who served in the Vietnam War. Maybe it was just his way of telling me, remember why you're here. Maybe he was a ghost. Maybe it really was me just telling myself that to let me know, yes, it's me showing you that I'm you, but not actually saying it. Then helping my parents before disappearing due to a time paradox. Something I just thought of is my mom always said that I looked like my dad when he was my age. My sister even says that I look so much like him. I still pretty much look like my dad anyways. So, maybe it was my dad's ghost helping us, and we had no idea. That would kind of explain why it didn't help anyone else while we're at the Vietnam Veterans Wall. I don't know. It still really trips me out to this day, and it makes me think about it. I think about it more now than I ever did. I even started looking up YouTube videos and pictures on Google on the Vietnam Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C. tonight to see if I could see anyone that looked like me. But nothing. Not a soul in the pictures or on YouTube looks like me. I know we all have doppelgangers out there, but if it was really mine, then how did he disappear so fast without anyone knowing or even seeing? 
I really wish I had said something about him looking like me. Hell, even asking for his name. Maybe one day I'll take another trip out there someday. Not just to see if he'll be there, but to also honor the soldiers at the memorial wall and say thank you for your service to all the soldiers who died in Vietnam. Well, I guess that's it. That's my story. If anyone has any stories like mine, please let me know in the comments section of Southern Cannibal's YouTube video, since I watch a lot of his videos and read the comments. Thank you. And once again, to all the veterans out there, thank you for your service. I really appreciate it. So a little background. My dad was a cop in our small town of about 15,000 people for 33 years. About five to seven years into the job, he and his partner were patrolling the area our house was actually in. They received a call out from an elderly person who was scared someone broke into their house and was making noise in the attic. It was a small attic, but was big enough to be a small bedroom. This house was about seven to eight houses down from our house and just around the corner of another street. And there had never been any call outs for this house. Now, it was a normal looking house, kind of a cookie cutter home since our neighborhood had been built in the 20s through the 40s. There was nothing really creepy about it whatsoever, so my dad and his partner weren't too concerned since our neighborhood was a pretty safe area of the town. They figured it was just wood creaking or something along those lines, since it was an older home. They arrived at the home and went to the door and knocked a few times. The older lady answered the door and my dad and his partner asked if they could come in. She quickly obliged. She then told them that she had been hearing noises from her attic off and on for the last few hours. At this point in the story, it's important to understand that my dad and his partner don't believe anything paranormal. So my dad said alright, he'll head up there and take a look. His partner stayed downstairs with the very nice lady who even offered him a cup of coffee. And as a cop working third shift, he couldn't turn that down. My dad started up the stairs and realized since the stairs were very narrow, he would soon be entering a really small space. There was a 90 degree turn with a few more stairs to get to the top. And as he turned, he heard what he thought was a TV on. He then proceeded up to get a good look into the room. It was only illuminated by the TV. A voice then said to him, Hi officer, I'm very sorry she called you. You see, she has dementia and sometimes she forgets I come up here for some peace and quiet. My dad, while finding the situation a little strange, all of a sudden told the man that he would let his wife know that it was just him and there was nothing to worry about. My dad then trekked back down the stairs to see his partner sipping some coffee and he then told the lady that it was just her husband upstairs watching TV and that there really wasn't anything to worry about. The woman's face went blank and she told them that her husband had passed away about two months ago. At this point, my dad knowing that she apparently has dementia attributed to her thinking that her husband had died, but he clearly didn't. My dad then asked his partner to go up the stairs and asked the man to come down to console his wife, who was showing a lot of anxiety. All of a sudden they heard boots blasting down the stairs like a galloping horse as his partner got to the bottom of the stairs. He then started to yell that they have to go and there's no one up there. It's just an empty room with cobwebs. My dad dropped the cup of coffee that he was holding for his partner and they bolted out the house and back into the cruiser. Knowing they had a job to do, they knew they couldn't just leave the lady scared and alone, so they took a minute to collect themselves and then briefly discuss what had been seen. They called for an additional unit and then went back inside to check on the lady. She was fine, just sitting on the couch. They then started to apologize for leaving so quickly. They then both went up the stairs to make sure it was empty, and it certainly was. It was later confirmed that her husband had in fact died about two months prior. Now, my dad never makes up stories. He doesn't believe in ghosts or anything of that nature. To this day, he still says there had to be a logical explanation. He said he knows what he saw was real and that he saw a man and spoke with them, but I think he knows he's lying to himself when he says there's a logical explanation. His partner's still around and they're still good friends, but they both chose to never speak of that night ever again. So this happened around two years ago when I was 14. For some context, 
I live in England. I'm a female, and it was around 9 o'clock in the winter. So it was dark by now, and my friend who I'll call Rosie for the story and I were leaving from a day out in London. We got into the bus, and everything seemed normal, and we were just laughing and joking around. When we were on the bus, I had noticed a man who looked around 18. He was quite short and he was standing up because the bus was busy and he was staring at Rosie and I, but we just decided to ignore it and over time, the bus got emptier and emptier. It was finally our stop and we pressed the button to notify the driver to stop, letting him know that we're getting off. As we stood up, the guy did as well and I kind of had an unsettling feeling. However, I just decided to ignore it and I told myself that I was just being paranoid. When we got off the bus, we had started walking towards my house as Rosie was having a sleepover and the creepy man just walked in the other direction. I was really so relieved because this whole time I thought he was going to follow us home. However, my relief was soon filled with dread when Rosie then looked at him and he noticed. I don't know what switched in his head but he turned around and then started walking towards us. We carried on walking and I still just tried to tell myself that I was just being paranoid because, well, I really didn't expect anything like this to happen to us. Rosie, who I thought was just being dramatic and I thought she was trying to scare me, then started running, but I ignored her and I just bent down to tie my shoelace. I turned around after I finished and I saw the man running right towards me. He was less than a meter away from me, and I don't think I've ever ran so fast in my life. I sprinted to my house, and just my luck, I forgot my house keys. I banged on my front door, just praying that my sister or mom would open up the door before it caught up to me. Thankfully, we got inside just as he was about to catch up to us, and slammed the door. We told my mom what happened, who went outside to check, but he was gone by then but it was still a scary experience nonetheless. I'd also like to say that the story ended here, but it didn't. A few days later, Rosie and I were going out to meet a guy that I was speaking to, and we saw the man yet again driving on a motorcycle. We decided to ignore it and carried on walking, but when the guy noticed us, he pulled up next to us and then tried talking to us. We ignored it though, and we walked past him, but then he pulled up in front of us, then stopping us from walking away from him. In a really creepy voice, he said, Don't worry girls, I'm not gonna hurt you. But that alone was enough to terrify us, and we then ran to the opposite side of the road, thinking that would stop him from getting to us. Luckily we saw the two guys we were meeting up with, then ran up to them, and the guy drove away. I really hate to think what would have happened to us if we hadn't ran into those guys when we did. Thank God for them. The following events happened over a year ago, and although some people might not find the following events to even be scary, but when you're the one living them, it's a completely different story. I'm 17 years old, young and dumb and I'm living a much better life than I was previously. A year ago at 16, I was the typical teenager mixed in with the wrong group of friends, which is true, but it wasn't a group of friends per se. It was more like an acquaintance who was mixed in with my then friend group, who negatively influenced us into doing some really ridiculous things. We'll call this acquaintance Harry for the sake of the story. I guess it all started when my friend started dating Harry. It seemed like the normal relationship. That is, until we got to know a bit more about Harry as an individual. He would go radio silent for hours at a time and would always have these episodes of random anger. He would always blame it all on his ADHD, which we all tried our best to understand. We had only known Harry for two to three months by this point, and his girlfriend, two other girls, myself included, and another boy decided to stay around him for the night as we all spent the day together and we thought it would be fun. And it was. We were drinking, playing music, etc. Until Harry decided to isolate himself from all of us. At this point, this was all typical Harry behavior until he stormed in the room we were all in, grabbed our male friend, and then started attacking him for no reason at all. 
It was like a switch just flipped off in his head. We all rushed right away to stop what was happening, but Harry was already on top of him, and it really didn't seem like he was going to stop. It actually took threatening to call the police to get him to stop. The night ended there, with the boy being left with some really bad bruises and a black eye. In all honesty, this really should have been the first red flag. It took a week for Harry to apologize, yet again blaming it on his ADHD, which again we all tried to understand. There were also other red flags, like Harry openly degrading all of us, including his girlfriend. He would also be a frequent abuser of drugs, which we didn't really want to become involved in. He would also become really possessive and controlling over small things like his girlfriend, his belongings, and even up to the people that myself and others would want to date. None of us were allowed to have any male crushes or even male friends, because he wanted to be the only male in all of our lives. We had probably known Harry for about five months at this point and we decided to spend the day out in a small wooded area that was surrounded by a park. It was only Harry, his girlfriend, and I brought my close friend at the time too, so I didn't feel like I was third wheeling, and Harry was acting strange again. He would look at my friend in a really disgusted way, and he would begin shouting at her and calling her names. Looking back, I should have gotten the both of us out of that situation sooner. The four of us had spent the majority of the day out together, and yet again, Harry snapped and became aggressive just like always, and even took this as far as to hit my friend, someone he had never even met. He hadn't even formed a proper opinion of her, only knowing her for a day, but he still went that far. I had stopped talking to Harry for a few weeks after that, taking some real offense on behalf of my friend, and even her and I didn't talk much after the previous events and I can't say I blame her. I then got a random message from Harry that said, Hey, I'm really sorry, but I've apologized to your friend. I want to make things better again, so if you want to come over and talk, feel free to come over at any point. A part of me wanted to believe that Harry really was trying to change and be a better person, but that couldn't have been more further from the truth. I decided to go over for the reasons being that I thought he had changed and that he was trying to be a better person. I arrived at his house at around 11.30 in the morning, and we talked for around three hours about how much he annoyed me and hurt me, and did the same for others. We eventually made up, and I thought we could even be friends again. We even spent some time playing on his PC, until I got up to go to the bathroom, and then I came back, and Harry was just sat there in silence, twiddling his thumbs. He had switched again. I sat down and called his name, but no response. He just turned around to his desk drawer, rumbled around, and then pulled out a switchblade. An actual fucking switchblade. I seriously thought that I was going to die. In that moment I could have cried, but I didn't. I was in shock. He then held it against my stomach, and I lost all hope. I then started crying, and he then began screaming at me telling me that it's all my fault and that they're telling him to do it and how easy it would be to kill me. I really wish that I never would have gone to his house to begin with and that I never would have had all this trauma to begin with. But shortly after Harry's dad came into the room then stopping Harry from possibly killing me. I honestly don't think I would even be here right now if it wasn't for Harry's dad coming into the room that day. I immediately left and blocked Harry on everything. I also decided to distance myself from the group of friends for a while until they did the same thing. Harry and his girlfriend didn't last much longer either, but I really can't say I'm surprised. He ended up eventually moving to the London area and I didn't really hear much about him for a while. That is, until recently. I found out that Harry got arrested for first degree murder. This crazy fucking psycho actually murdered someone. I can't even begin to describe the amount of guilt, relief, and pain that I felt when I heard that. All I gotta say is, Harry, if you're somehow thinking about all the crazy psychotic things you did to me and all those around you, I really hope it eats at you and you fucking rot in prison. I was 15 years old when this happened. I live in a flat in East London. It was a Sunday evening 
and I was home alone, while my parents, along with my brother and sister, were at my aunt's house to stay the night. And me being a teenager, I really enjoyed my solitude, so I decided to stay and study for an exam that was coming up. All of the lights except the TV were off in my sitting room as I was watching TV. It was then that I heard the letter slot opening, which was odd since no mail should be coming as it was Sunday, and it was also very late for mail to be coming at all. So I go to the corridor to have a peek at the door. That's when I notice two white balls in the mail slot. I creep a little closer until I'm about two inches away from the door. It was then that I realized it was a pair of eyes. I immediately jolted back as the guy then noticed me. The man then knocked, saying it was the electrician. Now, I know you may think I'm stupid for this, but... I open the door, seeing a man in a bright yellow jacket, and he asks, Hey, is your mother home? She called an hour ago for me to check the electricity in your home. Stupidly, I then said, Uh, no, I'm actually home alone. And the man suddenly grinned a really disturbing grin as my words entered his ears, and he asked if he could come inside. As I then closed the door to unlock the deadbolt, it was then that I realized my mother had made no calls an hour ago, and that she was at my aunt's house. That sudden realization made my heart drop. The man asked if he could come inside yet again, and I quickly locked the door, saying no. My mom said it's fine. We don't need him. I know he heard the panic in my voice, because right afterwards, he then tried to barge in the door with his shoulder. I honestly thought I was going to die. Then suddenly out of nowhere, I hear my neighbor screaming, and then footsteps coming away from my door. I look through the hole, and I see my neighbor Walter. I greet him, thanking him for possibly saving my life, and he said he called the police. 20 minutes later, the police arrive, and I gave a description of the guy and what he did. It was two weeks later when I got an update from the police saying the man has been detained and that he's been doing the same exact thing to several other families in the neighborhood. He would look through the door to check if the coast is clear and then he would slowly pick lock the door and then completely ransack the house. Hearing this made me sick to my stomach, but I'm so relieved that the man didn't succeed in breaking in our home. It really could have went so much worse if my neighbor Walter wasn't there when he was. I'm really thankful for him. A little background info. I live in London, England in Brixton, which if you're from London, you'll know you don't want to be there alone at night. Now me and my friend Anse in the story aren't in gangs, but we do sometimes sell drugs. We don't partake in most gang-related stuff, but some of our friends are gang members, which I'll get to later in the story. I had just taken a five-day trip with my family to the countryside, and I had stopped smoking weed for the five days, as opposed to every day, so my tolerance was very low. Since I was a kid, 15 or 16 at the time, me and my friend always went around on bikes. I had met my friend in the park to go smoke, at first it was all calm and I got very high and we stayed there for about an hour just listening to music and trying to find some parties to go to. We found one not too far away from us in a council estate so it was a big block party. We'd gotten on our bikes and I also want to mention that I was wearing thousands of pounds worth of clothes. It was only about two minutes into our cycling to the party when we came on this road which had no cars which was kind of strange since it was a main road, but it was 12.30 at night. We weren't too unnerved by it as usually if other gang members approach us, we'll tell them who we know and who our friends are, and they'll usually just leave us be and know who we're talking about. But this white Mercedes class had screeched its way down the road and slowed down right next to me and rolled down the windows. As I was really high, it took me a few minutes to process it, as I looked to my right, I see five Somali people with face masks, gloves, and also machetes shouting at me to pull over. Now, usually if it's fight or flight, I wouldn't usually flight, as I kind of enjoy the fight, and so does my friend. But I had a feeling I had seen them before, and my instincts despite being high 
told me to flight. My friend was a little further ahead of me, and I told him to just go. Don't look back. The car zoomed down the road right past us and into a side road, where all five of the now masked gang members then jump out of the car and start sprinting. We managed to make it around them as they jumped out a bit late, and at the end of the road, there happened to be an alley that blocked cars from going through. I heard them running after us for a few seconds, and even heard the falling of a knife. And as I look back, there was a knife that was thrown just meters away from me. We pedaled for our life and got to the alley, but it didn't stop there. We made it down the alley, which I guess these guys knew, as they then cut us off. They'd been waiting on the other side for us to come out, and then grabbed my friend Dance. I jumped off my bike and threw one of them off, which was enough time for my friend to jump onto his bike and we cycled into a park where we couldn't be followed. We waited behind a nursery at the park, and while we were waiting, Ant said that he knew those guys were beefing with one of our closest friends, and they must have seen us with them before, and thought we were involved. My friend then tells me he thinks he has a cut in his stomach, and as the adrenaline was wearing off, he pressed onto his stomach, and there was blood all over his hands. Keep in mind, it was winter, so we had really big jackets and about six layers of clothes, and we couldn't really see any blood. It turns out he had been stabbed with a flick knife. We ended up calling an ambulance to take us to the hospital, and they said it didn't hit any vital organs, and within about three or four days, he was right back out. I know who they were and why they wanted us, but trying to kill people they never met, that's something I'll never understand in the London gang culture or something I'd agree with. We both nearly died. About a week after this, one of them had actually been put in the news for killing one of my friend's friends and is facing a trial. That could have easily been us, but I'm really glad it wasn't. No, this happened just last night and I'm still a little shaken up over it. I'll try to retell the story exactly as it happened, but the occurrence may have fogged my memory a bit. My name is Jason. I'm a 17-year-old male, and I work second shift at a local Walmart in a small central city. At about 10 p.m. after my work period was over, I was driving home when I decided to stop for gas. In retrospect, it was really stupid to stop at all. The gas station was poorly lit, and it was completely vacant of other customers, but I knew the shady areas of my town, and this was not usually one of them. I pulled up to the pump, expecting nothing less than just a quick in and out visit to the station, and began fueling my car. I waited for about a minute or so until I heard that prompting click of the gas nozzle. Just as I closed my fuel cap, I grabbed my receipt and began making my way to my driver's side door. An unsettling looking woman pulled up right beside me, regardless of all the other surrounding pumps that she could have gone to. I didn't think too much of it though, given that I was just leaving anyway, and just continued on to open my car door. But then I hear her shout something. Hey boy, come here. While then motioning me over with her bony, tattered fingers. Me being the friendly person that I am, decided to engage in conversation with her, despite my immense feeling of uneasiness. I conferred back, then saying, uh, yes, miss. How can I help you? I now realized that I should have put more consideration into my words. As she then said, Yeah, I need you to come over here and pump my gas for me. Which I thought to be a bit odd considering she looked perfectly capable and she didn't even give me a reason as to why she couldn't do it herself. But stupidly, I decided to give her the benefit of the doubt. I started walking over to her vehicle when I then picked up on a bit of a red flag. She had already turned her car off as if it was ready to be filled up, except that her tank lid wasn't on that side of the car. Once again, I just gave her the benefit of the doubt and then thought, well, maybe she just forgot which side it was on and continued round to the pump nearing her car. And then I saw it. The second big red flag just on the other side of her car was a light that I could vaguely see through her window, hence illuminating everything within the back seat of the car. Even through the densely tinted window of her sliding van door, I could vaguely see the silhouette of at least two grown men staring right at me. When she noticed I had saw them, 
her entire demeanor completely changed. Her face looked cold as snow and then turned into an angry, frustrated look. And that was it for me. There were too many bells that were going off in my head telling me to get the hell out of there. Just as I began to back up towards my car, she started screaming at me, demanding me to come back. I then bolted to my driver's side door, which was luckily left unlocked, turned on my engine, and then threw it into drive. I booked the hell out of that gas station without a second thought. Luckily, they didn't appear to follow me as I got onto the more far populated interstate. It also didn't occur to me to contact the police at the time since I was so in shock. I just really hoped they didn't find another victim because of me not informing the proper authorities about it. It's a really scary world out there, so if you ever have an uneasy feeling in your gut like that, trust it. To both those creepy men and that woman, I just pray and hope I never see you guys again. This happened to my mom when she was just 21 years old in the late 1990s. For some context, the gas station is off an exit on the interstate. It's about one mile from all the other fast food places and gas stations. The trade-off was that the gas station was a little bit cheaper than all the other gas stations. Anyways, her manager put her on the night shift. She said that she never really liked the night shift, especially after this incident. It was a really chilly night in early October, so everyone who came in was always wearing a hoodie. At about 10 p.m., this man came inside the gas station. He was wearing a plaid shirt and shorts. He looked around the store for a minute. He then comes up to the counter with a Coke and a bag of chips. Like normal, my mom scans his stuff and he pays. No one else is in the gas station at this point and the guy's now walking away, so she starts making small talk with him. So pretty cold weather we're having, huh? She said. The man didn't say anything back, just stared at her. Then he just suddenly said, You know, I'd really like to take you back to my house. You're just really hot. Sir, I'm not going back to your place, my mom said. You know who's going to stop me? I can just make you come with me if I want. The guy said this as he was actually reaching over the counter to her. My mom then grabbed the bat that was underneath the desk and then hit him with it as hard as she could. And she told him if he didn't leave, she was going to hit him again. The man grabbed his stuff and then finally walked out. After the man left, she kept checking the security cameras and she saw that he was just standing in the parking lot. She said that her anxiety was really high. She eventually had to go to the bathroom because she had two large coffees. While she was in the bathroom, she heard the door open. She thought it was just another woman using the restroom, but the person that was there was wearing men's shoes. She knew right then that it was the man from earlier. She pulled up her pants, opened the stall door, and then punched the man right in the face. It was almost time for day shift to arrive. Once one of the people from day shift arrived, my mom then asked them if they'd walk her out to her car. They did, and she got home safe that morning. When she later woke up at noon to watch the news, there was a man on the news that said there were multiple attempted kidnappings near that same gas station. My mom was really lucky that night. I still really shiver thinking about what could have happened to her. I used to travel a lot with my husband because we had drag boats. We had been to Arizona to a boat race. Well, we were coming back and we had to drive through West Texas. I had been sleeping, but when we got to El Paso, my husband woke me up and he said he needed for me to drive. And so I got behind the steering wheel to drive. My husband put gas in the van and he got me a Dr. Pepper so that I'd have some caffeine to drive. We were driving down the highway going east. I drove for a really long way. My son was asleep in the van and our other friend was with us as well. We had driven a really long way and I noticed it was time for gas again. My husband was in the co-pilot sound asleep, so I pulled into the gas station out in the middle of nowhere. When I got there, I woke up my husband and I asked him to give me money for gas. He did and our son also wanted to get out and go inside with me because he needed to use the bathroom and he also wanted a snack. I went inside, took him to the bathroom, and I went too. I came out of the bathroom, went to the cashier, and gave her my money, 
and I was trying to hurry my child out to the car. When we got outside, I went to put the gas in the van. I got my child back in the van and then went back to go get my change. By this time, the van was suddenly being surrounded by men. They just seemed to come out all over the place. I looked at the cashier and then asked her, Are you here alone? She nodded yes, but she said that her husband was on his way here. She said in a low voice because some of them had come inside. She asked if I would stay inside with her for a minute, and I said yes. There must have been about 10 or more men all around the van, and some coming in the store. There was probably about 15 or more altogether. I knew that my child was safe in the van, and my husband and our friend were in the van too. I said to the cashier that my husband and our friend are in the van, so I stood there, acting as if we were chatting. I told her we had been to a boat race, and so on. It was about 3 or 4 in the morning. The lady was just desperately looking at me, like she just really didn't want me to leave yet. So like the good person I am, I just kept talking to her. Finally, after a few minutes, her husband comes inside, and she sighs of relief. I then said goodnight to her, and I walk outside to the van. There were still a few men all around the boat, kind of just staring at the van and boat. They tried to talk to me, but they were speaking in Spanish, so I wasn't able to understand them. The van also had dark tinted windows, so they couldn't see inside it. They were really trying, though. I finally opened the door, and then said to my husband, How far away are we from Border Patrol? The reason I asked this is because we had a CB radio in the van. But as soon as I said Border Patrol loudly, the men all looked at each other, and they all started running away back to the store. My husband starts laughing. A couple of the men went into the store and said something, and the rest all came out and started running. When I got inside the van, my husband had asked me why I'd said that. Well, it weren't, didn't it? I replied. Our friend was now laughing about the whole encounter. I didn't know it at the time, but our friend had a gun with him. He said that he had his gun out, and he'd actually told my husband that if they open the door, cover your ears. But as you know, Luckily, it never resorted to that, and we were able to roll out of there safely. As we drove down the highway, I was asking them why they didn't get out when they surrounded the boat. They said the cover was really tight, and they wouldn't be able to get it off without a lot of work. So, I guess it all worked out. But I told them when we get to the next gas stop, one of them are definitely putting the gas in. We got to San Angelo where we dropped off our friend, and drove the rest of the way back to Austin. I really couldn't believe that lady was there all alone like that. I mean, I wasn't terrified or anything, but I was definitely concerned. I've never shared this story before with anyone. For some reason, I've always been a bit of a freak magnet. I mean, sometimes that's a lot of fun, but sometimes it's really horrifying. This all happened way back in the 1980s, yeah, I'm old. I worked at a gas station that was really just a lot, with about 10 to 12 self-serving gas pumps, as well as a small cubicle building with plexiglass windows for customers to pay and buy cigarettes, as well as small items. I was a farm girl, and it was one of my very first real jobs. Now, I worked second shift, which meant closing at midnight on Friday and Saturday nights. Now, our town was fairly small, and it had low crime so usually, I really felt safe. I could handle the occasional drunk or awkward flirty customer. One beautiful warm summer night, a swarmy guy came in on a bike. He was very obnoxious, and after some inappropriate sex attempts at coming on to me, he asked if I would go for a ride with him when I got off work that night. Being raised a polite and respectful person, I kindly declined, telling him I wasn't allowed to date customers. It was obviously a lie, but I just wanted him to leave. There were a few other people who came in and out, but he just kept lingering around. A small rush came through, and he finally got on his bike and peeled out. I believe that that was supposed to be impressive or something. It really wasn't, but I was just really relieved that this greasy dude was gone now. Well, after about an hour later, the guy shows back up. He seems a little more drunk and more persistent than before telling me how lucky I would be to be with him. Look, dude, you really need to go. 
My boyfriend will be picking me up when I get off work. I lied. My car was parked down to the side edge of the lot behind a storage shed that we stored all our stock in. After trying to be civil and not provoke him into any kind of weird scene, he finally leaves again. I sigh of relief, but I'm still really on edge and I just want to close up and get out of town for the night. It's pretty dark and it's almost midnight at this point. I finally do all of my end of shift things and I have to go to our storage shed to count cigarettes and get what I need to restock the little cubicle for the day shift person. I walk in and I hear a bike motor getting really close to the lot. Luckily I had the keys in my hand and I immediately grabbed the door and locked myself in. I knew it was him. I tried to just be quiet and hope that he would think that I already left when I heard his bike slowly putter around the lot. Even though I was locked in this wooden storage shed, I still felt the need to hide between some motor oil cases. His bike gets very close, and the motor shuts off. I'm 5 foot 4 and 105 pounds, and I'm unarmed. I'm praying he doesn't hear my heart pounding out there. Suddenly the door is then violently being tugged. He's now banging and yelling. Hey baby, I know you're in there. Let me in. You know you want me. The guy's even more drunk now than before, and there was no phone in the so-called warehouse. I thought that I would just barricade the door and stay there till morning if I had to. It seems like half the night the guy had tried to get in, banging the door getting angry and threatening me. But then he finally got bored, and I heard his bike pill out again. I knew that I probably had a few minutes to get my purse, lock the cubicle, and then run like hell to my car. I very slowly cracked open the door and then peeked out. The sound of the bike was getting further and further away. I then took a deep breath, and I ran. That honestly must have been a record for closing a store. As I tore out of the lot in my car, I thought that I had seen a bike headlight coming down the street. Luckily, I made it out of town and safely home, though. Needless to say, I called and quit that job. It definitely wasn't worth the $3 or whatever an hour for an 18-year-old girl to be doing that. About a month later, there was big news in our town. A local woman was found beaten unconscious. She was found early one morning by a storage unit facility. They found the guy who did it later that week. And yep, you guessed it. It was Greasy Bike Guy. The woman fortunately did survive, and he was sentenced to 17 years in prison. He's definitely out by now. I'm not sure what the rest of his story is or hers, but I hope she's doing okay. I feel very lucky that someone must have been watching out for me. I'm a 27 year old female from a really small town in Georgia. I'm really no stranger to being hit on or stared at by men of all ages, but that's usually as far as it goes. That is, until one night. The story happened only a few weeks ago. I was staying with my sister and we were up late doing some arts and crafts together. At about midnight, we decided we wanted to go to a gas station nearby to get something to drink and some cigarettes. On the way to the store, I noticed that we needed gas and I figured since we were already going to a gas station, I might as well go ahead and fill up. When we got to the store, I pulled up to the pump farthest from the station, which I now realize was really a mistake. As I walked to the store entrance, I noticed a man sitting on the sidewalk right in front of the store. I didn't make eye contact or speak and just walked inside. After paying for my stuff, I walked outside and I immediately noticed the man that was sitting down on my way inside was now standing and staring directly at me. But this wasn't just any old stare. It was a stare of intent and it made me nervous. I pretended not to notice and started walking back to my car where my sister was waiting at. But as I walked past the man, I watched in my peripheral vision as he immediately got behind me and started following closely. I didn't want him to know that I saw this as it made me feel like I had the element of surprise on him as opposed to him having it on me. I just kept walking forward, watching him as best as I could from my peripherals. From what I could see of his face, his eyes were totally fixated on me with a kind of malice that just really made me shudder. And if I'm being honest, still does. I don't know what this man had planned for me, but I just knew it was no good. Thank God my sister rode with me 
and thank God she was paying attention to all this. As I approached the car, I looked at my sister with kind of the help me look, and I saw her staring ferociously behind me right at the man. He clearly noticed this too, because as I turned around to face him, I saw him look past me into the car, and then with another stroke of luck, another car pulled into the store and up to the pump right behind me. The man that had been following me with unstaggering intent just a few moments before suddenly shuffled awkwardly to the side and then walked off, looking down at the road. I held my breath while my sister and I pumped the gas and then finally exhaled when we pulled out of the parking lot. I don't think I've ever felt so threatened before in my life. I honestly felt like I was prey being stalked by a predator. This is a really crazy scary world we live in today. Always be wary of your surroundings and be careful out there. You really have no idea who's watching you and what they have planned for you.